I think there are three things. Attitudes, we have to concentrate on attitudes, on knowledge, and on skills. What, I, what do I mean by attitudes? Well, as every headmaster or headmistress wants to say, we help them, we want to help them to love learning and to learn to explore. But also, we want to teach them about, in Kensington Wade, we're very keen on this, interdependence. This is something we've learned from Chinese schools. Chinese schools are very good at getting children to work together and also to learn from their peers and older people, to understand that they're not individuals, that in fact they must work together with others in order to succeed and to help others succeed. We also want them to do as you would be done by. This is both a Christian and a Confucian expression. Do treat other people as you would like to be treated. But in particular, we want them to have respect for and obligation to their teachers, parents, and those who made their society better. Because that way, you can learn from the past, or indeed from the recent past and present, and develop not only a sense of being able to do things yourself, but of how people have done things in the past and learn from that as well. And also, we want, among our attitudes, a sense of responsibility in the choices that you make, the responsibility in the career that you select. Kensington Wade has two mottos. They're both Chinese. The, the first one is an admonition to young people. Xiu Shen, Qi Jia, Zhu Guo, Ping Tian Xia. It's a very, very well-known Chinese motto. Develop yourself, provide for your family, serve your country, and make your peace with the world. Your first job as a young person is to make the best of yourself at school. When you've done that, the purpose, of course, is to make sure that you earn enough money for your family and keep them going. After that, you can think about serving your country and then making your contribution to humanity at large, if you can do so. After attitudes, we emphasize knowledge. A common core, first of all, a collective cultural experience so that children belong. In our school, that will be two cultural cores, both English and Chinese, because we want our children to be bicultural as well as bilingual. But we also want to expose them to different ways of thinking about the world, how experimental scientists work, how data is used to inform policy or write history, how novelists tell truth, how another culture thinks. And this, for our children, most of whom are Europeans, is very important. They're going to learn how Chinese people think about the world and about learning at the same time as having a thoroughly English education and also how people thought in the past, in other words, history. This is the kind of knowledge that we think is essential to young children. Finally, skills. Attitude, knowledge, skills. What are the skills? Most important, how to learn. That includes IT, of course. How to acquire knowledge on your own. How to read to understand. How to find data to prove or disprove hypotheses. And how to get very young children thinking clearly and working out how to find information. Secondly, writing, because writing makes you think. If you write something down, if you write the old-fashioned essay, this is why for so many of us suffered for so long at university writing essays, because it's supposed, if it's done well, to help you think things through and work out what you know and what you don't know, and what you can provide evidence for and what you can't. But also speaking, that sounds obvious. But I remember being tremendously impressed when I first went to a Chinese primary school and saw children getting up and talking about their experience of the holidays or what they did last weekend or the little book that they'd read. Articulate communication. Of course, it was very basic. But little by little, children can improve, can understand how to speak logically and indeed how to use the skills of rhetoric uh, in a way that they will understand even if they don't know the meaning of the word rhetoric. And finally, conversation. Conversation is an art, conversation is a skill. Getting information from people, sharing information, developing ideas together, being entrepreneurial together, being enterprising together. And finally, among those list of skills are those things which I just call essential skills, such as grammar and mathematics. Bill Gates, and I think everybody knows Bill Gates, said a wonderful thing on a trip to Japan. A journalist said to him, don't you think Japanese education is so uncreative it's all rigid, it's all rote learning, it's all memory work and so on. And they just concentrate on grammar and mathematics. And he said, I never met, excuse my American accent, 
I never met a creative person, an innovator, who didn't have good grammar and math. So we believe, like Bill Gates, in essential skills. We have a second motto, apart from the one I gave you, and it's a simpler motto, which means develop yourself and share your talents. This is the motto of Kensington Way Dual Language English Chinese School, and we hope that our little boys and girls will take that with them for the rest of their lives. That's all I have to say on the future of education. Thank you for your attention. And those entering secondary school now will enter a world where 50 to 70 percent of the jobs they will do haven't yet been cre created. Where would you be advised to invest your money right now? With the increase, increase of automated services, what will the landscape look like 10 years from now? What direction would I advise my children to follow? I'll come back to this later. We sleep two hours less a night than we did in the 1920s, and rather keeping up with the Joneses, we aim to satisfy our own personal needs with products and services, including those that save us time. We want speed and access to acquire what we desire. I never dreamt in the past I would be shouting at the screen in front of me when the network was slow. Or yesterday, for example, on the train, I was frustrated because I couldn't complete my Marks and Spencers order for stuff I wanted for today. At a conference last week, I was sat next to a chap and couldn't place where I knew him from, so I googled him under the, t under the table to save embarrassment. The speed and efficiency we work at and the access to information we have opens to so many opportunities to many of us. And even at my age, I want to work faster and smarter and crave learning. The knock-on effect manifests itself in so many ways. How we are developing as human beings and coping with the increasing mental health issues that children are facing today. Opportunities are limitless now. Classrooms are increasingly becoming places to nurture and shape ideas and knowledge that children bring to class, not what they've learned in class. Learning flipped a long while ago. But as schools, have we embraced it? And do our inspection regimes reflect that in their reports? If you change the sump nut on your 1990s Citroen, you can find out how to do it by looking on YouTube. These are probably not too reliable statistics, but not too far, far off. 65,000 videos are uploaded a day, and there are in excess of 100,000 courses available online. My daughter, who's studying at London University, announced on Friday night that she was able to access other courses on her learning platform. And with £9,000 a year, I'm really glad about that, and I might be looking at them myself tomorrow. When you realize how you learn, you don't feel such a dummy, and confidence grows. But we are now all producers, not consumers. That's what we have now, the ability to we have to blog, for models to become models, not because of what they've been through, but how many followers they have. We are not all the same, and that's what we recognize at LVS. It's about the individual learning differently and at different times. The quality of GCSE and A-level revision sites with learning modules is outstanding and allows children to work at their own pace, at their own level, and the opportunities for differentiation are amazing, much more productive than a traditional learning environment. The confines of a traditional classroom is not the way ahead, in my opinion. And that's very strange, coming from the head of a very large independent school. I'm not selling myself out of a job, and I want the school to remain open, but we now need to look at how we can work as educators. We need to foster curiosity, self-esteem, build resilience and confidence in our young people and educate them to be safe. Do we encourage enough innovation and entrepreneurship with our children? Do we risk-take as much as we need to to give them the skills to go outside and make a difference. If you asked me two years ago my thoughts about apprenticeships, I would have been quite negative, but the landscape again is changing rapidly. At school, we have a party of working parents in industry who look at challenges of the future and help initiate programs in school. And in October, we held an event where speakers such as Richard Woods, apprenticeship finalist 200, 2015, and HR leaders from across industries, including Coca-Cola, came to our school to talk about apprenticeships. They're changing. One, because the government has a levy. I'm working on the ground floor, learning at the same time, and not having the student debt of university is attractive. How many of us are brave enough to take that route? I'm still slightly sat on the fence. 
So what do I say to my children? My oldest two children are 21 and 19. We encourage them into degree subjects where they would learn a trade. They both did economics degrees, one a BSA in finance, now taking his chartered financial analyst exams, another the BA in economics, which is more uh, about behavioral economics rather than finance, two very different children. We've talked about how the world will be, especially in finance, certain professions disappearing. And as a, at the moment, as an educator and mentor, I believe that automated services will significantly impact on the workforce. But the human factor, even in finance, will be more crucial in the future. Human, human interpretation of data and trends will be so important. I never thought I would say this about my son, who's in year 11. Just three school years between him and number two. He is on his computer at least three hours a day when he's finished his prep, and often much more at the weekends. To my husband and I, in our, in our 50s, this was originally horrific, especially when the new computer he wanted was, in our opinion, the price of a good second-hand car. I'm still suspicious, but for what he wants to do in the future, what is the difference in him practicing on his computer three to four hours a day than me practicing the piano three to four hours a day 40 years ago? Why should my snobbery and reins of traditional education, including my still current suspicion of apprenticeships, bar him from embracing the future? Who knows what's best, him or me? I, can't, I can have my opinions, I can pass on my skills and give my care and provide an excellent curriculum, but that's where it stops. The future isn't mine. It belongs to your children, and they're already shaping it. So for me, the future of education is to nurture and protect our children, give them every opportunity to find and develop new skills, whatever they are, make them resilient and proud without being arrogant, and instill good traditional values of decency and develop excellent social skills. Allow them to learn in whatever way suits them and follows the path that makes them the most happy. Happiness is the key. We should not necessarily be, be guided by what our parents think or the schools dictated by the dinner party circuit to, that are supposed to be the best. Your child is an individual, and the early choices you make for them now is their future. Be brave, make the right choices, and I'm glad it's not me. Thank you.